Easter. I know we did on the marriage retreat, and Pete did this amazing big barbecue, which uh, that's his big thing on the Saturday night. We had a singles retreat. Some of you had too many Easter eggs, or if you didn't, you definitely did now. And uh, it's always good to have holiday. You know, in the Bible, there's lots of good holidays. But I did promise that when we were back, we would get into it. And uh, so this lesson is for my heart, your heart, everybody's heart, because um, I'm dragging myself out of a holiday type thing. So it's entitled simply, Setting Your Heart, Mind and Soul to Saving the Lost. Okay? Because we've got a clear run now, six months until the conference, where we're just about saving the lost. So let me state the obvious. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So if we are little Jesuses, if we are little Christians, we are to do the same, which is to seek and save the lost. Um, and we're practicing Christians because it's quite hard being a Christian if you hadn't noticed. So I'm not a perfect Christian, I'm a practicing Christian. So it was also the purpose Jesus gave to his disciples right from the beginning of their calling. So the first thing he did was say, let me tell you what I'm all about. Mark 1.16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew cast a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And once they left their nets and followed him. So he's going, hey guys, do you enjoy your job? Fishing for fish. I've got something more exciting. See, fish can be, in some regards, predictable if you're an expert fisherman. And I've been to the Sea of Galilee, and it's big, but not that big. So you sort of figure out if they're not over there, they're over there. Okay, as opposed to the sea. And he said, you know, is that what you really want to do with your life? I know most of us grow up going, I want a career, I want to do this. Actually, most of us, when we go, this is the career I want, when we get into it, you go, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And that's very, very common today. People study one thing and go on to do a different thing. But Jesus goes, you know, it doesn't matter what you've chosen, let me tell you, I've got something really exciting for you. Did they really understand what that meant? I don't think so. I didn't think, did Peter think he would go and preach in Rome and all the other apostles? I don't. But what I think they went is like, well, just fishing for fish for the rest of my life is not where I really want to be. It was a mission Jesus gave to his disciples right up until the end of his life. So Jesus was consistent. Many people have said in Matthew 28, it's his last word. So we, you know, see those movies like, oh, I'm about to die and tell mom I love her. Okay, so quite important words. Matthew 28, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Here's the same message, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. So I think it sort of expanded. You know, when he first went to them, he said, come to me and I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't want to overwhelm them. He didn't go, you know, I want you to go to the whole world. Let's just, let's just try fishing a couple of men in the local area to begin with. But by the end of it, he's going, this is, this is the real plan. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, I saw into missionaries this week, um, some in India, Ricky in India, Paul in Cambodia, um, all sorts of different places. These people had to go and learn the languages. That's quite overwhelming to learn, you know, Cambodian and preach in Cambodian or, or Urdu or, or Hindu or something like that. So he didn't want to overwhelm, and I think when we come in as Christians, you go, I know what it was like for me when I was first a Christian, like, if I can invite one person today, that would be pretty awesome. Do you know what I mean? I used to get on the train to, to work, and I was like, if I could sort of sit next to somebody, open the Bible, sort of hope they ask me, you know, I'd sit there with the biggest Bible in the world going, are you going to notice I'm sort of throwing this in your face? That's where I started. It's where a lot of us start. But by the end of it, he goes, guys, it's three years now. Here's the big plan. It was the continual message preached by the leaders of the first century church. So in Jude, and Jude was Jesus' brother, um, you know, uh, many decades later, Jude 1.21, it said, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. He goes, so you've got to make sure you stay a Christian. And any of the older Christians would go, that's hard enough. <laughs> Ros is smiling at me. <laughs> um, Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating what even the clothing stained by corrupt flesh. So you've got to snatch anybody you can. And it's a little bit like that, isn't it? When you evangelize on the bus, it's, it's like a snatch moment. You go, this is it. I've just, I've got to make the, mo make the most of this moment. Or you're at a petrol station and you invite the It's just a snatch. It's not a, a long conversation. It's a snatch. 
I remember the first person I met here who became a Christian, Andrew. Um, it was up by Sydney University, and he parked cheekily in the office works, okay, because then they didn't really check that you only parked for a whole day. And I met him on the corner, and I go, hi, do you want to come to a Bible discussion? He went, yep. I said, can I get your number? Yep. He took his number and said, do you want to talk to him? No, I'm busy. That was it. That was it. I followed up with him for nine months. He became a Christian. Christine became a Christian as a result. His sister, um, Isaac, who's in Brisbane, uh, then Eric married Christine. So that one snatch of a moment, that's all it was. You know, it says, while we have varying abilities in our ability to be fruitful, become a Christian, uh, help somebody become a Christian, the concept of producing a crop is expected from us all. So in the parable of the sower, it says, Mark 4, 20, others like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce the crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. I thought about this, and I thought, okay, I'd like to be at least fruitful once a year, but 30, 60, sometimes, you know, 30, that might be once every two years. I'm just taking these numbers as well. It might be like twice a year. In other words, you have good years, bad years, some of us are more effective than others, but the thing is, is God expects us to do something with this good news that he's given us. The growth of the first century church, when all the Christians were striving to evangelize the world, was obvious to all. So I think what is expected of groups today is they compare themselves to other churches. The problem with that is you need to, con to compare yourself to the biblical church. So Acts 2.41, those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Acts 2.47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. How do we know that it was daily? But actually, if you actually go to Jerusalem, there are the baptism pools outside the temple. So we know from the scriptures that people often went to the te temple court daily. So in other words, there was this sort of big group of people that was always talking about Jesus, debating, and at the end of the day, they'd have gone, hey, anyone want to get baptized? Let's go over there. So talking in the temple courts, a little bit like the, uh, the um, colony, col colonies in um, the courtyard in Sydney University. It's that sort of thing, but on a much bigger scale. Um, so uh, Acts 4.4, but many who heard the message believed, so the number of men... Uh, who believed grew to about 5,000. So you've got this 3,000, and then the number sort of changes to the men. In other words, they're talking about the leadership of the church. Acts 5.14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Now you're promoting, hey, the men and the women. We've got to make sure this grows evenly. Acts 6.1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So now you see like this daily community, it was growing, different parts of the world were coming in. Acts 6, 7, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So now it's not just in Jerusalem, it's starting to really get out there. It's, it's not only numerical, it's starting to be geographical. So this concept of sort of the community church, that, that's not in the Bible. Acts 8, uh, four, those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Well, if you go back to Acts 2, it lists all these different places they come from, from Rome, from Antioch, all these places. Now, in the persecution, they were scattered to go and build the churches out there. And we were just, um, Keanu and I were just looking this up. This is like one or two years after Acts 2. So now, after a couple of years, they're starting to plant churches outside. Acts 9.31, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria, enjoyed a time of peace and were strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. So now you're sort of going, okay, it's like, you know, Parramatta, you know, Ride, and maybe Cronulla. It's, it's like giving the areas, it's going out. Acts eleven twenty one. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now it's like, we can't even keep, like, it went from sort of 3,000, it was the first big day, then daily, which is right, now it's like, oh, a bunch of people. You know what I mean? There was no computers and, you know, calculators. Just, there's a whole bunch of people now. Acts 12, 24. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Acts 13, 49. The word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. So now it's like the whole, re like everybody in all these little villages, they're getting to hear about it. Acts 14, 1. 
At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual to the Jewish synagogue, where they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. So now you've got the Greeks coming into the church, and it's starting to name different towns. Acts 14, 21, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Now, hey, now we're starting to really plant some of the bigger churches. Acts 16, 5, so the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. So it's not just the home church, it's all the churches. Acts 17, 14, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So it's now, as the church is getting bigger and bigger, it's really focusing on the leadership, okay? Acts 17, 6, RSV, these men who had turned the world upside down have come here also. Now people are going, hey, the whole world is knowing about this new religion. In Colossians 1, 6 and 23, it says... In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it had been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope and held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So now, from sort of 30, 31 AD to 61 AD, everybody knew about the kingdom of God. In 30 years, it was out there. Paul was in prison in Colossians, Acts, uh, in Colossians and Acts 28. And he's going, hey, it's got everywhere now. That doesn't mean everybody became a Christian. It's a bit like most people have heard of, I don't know, Coca-Cola or McDonald's. So you go, the whole world knows about this. Everybody knew about this thing, whether they were believing it or not. Therefore, Jesus' vision became a reality of evangelizing the nations in his generation. We see it was done. That's what we as a church and as a movement are trying to imitate today. To put the latest crown of thorns there, literally in the last 20 years, you see that you know, it grew out of uh, Los Angeles. We call Judah and Samaria the equivalent United States, Canada. That's like Israel and Judea. Then we're going out to all the other uh, cities and countries. Obviously, we were planted here um, just a little over 10 years ago. And then God, you, you know, which satellite, we San Paolo and all these different places. And then we're going out to all those different places. So now, obviously, Fiji this year, Brisbane, uh, and uh, Melbourne, and then we had Auckland, uh, China. They're baptizing again this week. We have tai Taipei, um, Hong Kong, Samoa, Fiji, um, and now we're doing Wellington at the end this year. And then we're forming the Beijing mission team as of this weekend, which will be led by uh, Mark and Lan up in the north with Charlotte. Uh, Jai's in that Bible talk, Sybil's in that Bible talk. So that's a real vision, like, let's go Beijing, okay? Now that's our plan, it may be Shanghai, we don't know, just like last year was Singapore, but it ended up being Fiji and Melbourne. But we're gonna start going, hey, all these Chinese crazy people that love Jesus, time to go home, okay, at the end of your university. So it's exciting to see what biblical Christianity should be. It's exciting to go, hey, this room is already filled up. We just, remember like, this was filled up and we just sent out 30 people and it's starting to fill up again. So it's about, you know, we've got to send some more people out, find a bigger venue. So I'm going to talk about three different things here. Point one, setting your heart to saving the lost. So far what I've talked about is to your mind, as in intellect. Isn't this great? This happened in the early church. But Mark 10, 17 says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus just ripped this guy's soul out. <laughs> this guy loved money. He said, just give it all up. That's why right beforehand, it said he loved him. Have you ever been in a Bible study and you brought a friend to your leader, and they challenged him really hard, and then you sort of feel like, actually, I'm siding with the non-Christian here that I think that was a little bit too hard. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, jeez. Was that really loving? But laying out the gospel is the most loving thing we can do. My question to you, and I have to ask myself, do you really want to love the lost? 
Really? Jesus did. Let me ask some questions. Have you had friends out to church this year, this last month? Is it a challenge for you to bring people to church? Honestly. Have you studied the Bible with people this year, this month? Is it a challenge for you to just get out the Bible? I appreciate Tim. Tim's not really had a problem with this. Tim has different struggles, but he's like, I found another guy, I just met him at Starbucks. Another guy, I was studying the Bible with him. I grabbed his kid, I was like, Kenji, and I just grabbed him when we went. We just studied the Bible with him. That's Tim. That's Tim. Is that you? Are you like, let me just find somebody and go? Is evangelism, following up with people, pouring your time into people, a joy in your life or a challenging burden that you feel like you have to do? Let's just get honest. I've had times in my life when, you know, there's another baptism. I'm going, oh, I've been a Christian 20 years. Good for them. That's where my heart has been. Where is your heart today? Let's just be honest. Is it e- it's easier to be unloving than it is loving, isn't it? It just is. Being selfish comes naturally to most of us, if not all of us. It takes a decision to be selfless, followed by repeat decision after decision after decision. Would it be fair to say that this generation is more selfish than any other? I don't think so. I really don't. I just think your selfishness is easier to see. That's all. You put it up on Facebook. Well, look at me. What am I doing? And you have no idea. You're like, what are you doing? Okay. Whereas in my day, you could be selfish and no one would even know. But I think this generation has a bit of an unfair reputation. I can tell you in my 20s and my teens, I was just, if not more, selfish than you. It's just we weren't called out on it. That's all. The real question is, do you love to love? Or are you more consumed with being loved? Have you ever come to church or left church and I just didn't feel loved tonight? We, you know what? People who come to church to love never walk away with that feeling. Because you always find somebody to love. Okay? Like, I organized the game tonight. If it was unenjoyable, there was only one person to blame. Oh, me. Okay. So if you came tonight and you didn't feel loved, it's because you didn't try and love somebody. If you did, you know, when we bring new people in the church, we go, hey, come to church and try and make three new friends tonight. Ask them five new questions. You actually have to teach them how to build a relationship. Now, you older Christians, you know how to do that. But we can just withdraw into being selfish. Do you wake up thinking about how you can do more to make others feel loved? Is that like, what can I do today? I know in the ministry, one of the real privileges is that's all we think about. Now, you may think they don't think about me at all. All I do is think about every member in this church. That's all. I wake up and go, go through my phone. I do, that. do I think they're okay? Are you happy? Are you happy? Do I think they're okay? I'm not saying I get it right all the time. That's my job. But it became my job because it was my passion. I appreciate Roz and Jeremy. They came to the church and went, can you give us a list of everybody in the church? I want to just start praying through them. That was their heart. Uh, this is what God does. All right? God's very secure in himself, and he doesn't, he figures out that most people don't love him. But I'm not saying he's okay with that, but he's a big boy and can handle that, as opposed to us. God thinks about saving us all the time. So did Jesus. This is what it means to be godly and Christ-like, to focus on others. How far would you go for a lost sheep? Are you willing to go the extra mile? Matthew 5, 20, uh, uh, 41 says, hey, one of the ways we can evangelize, you know, when the Romans come and go, they had a law. They said, you've got, you know, you can carry my stuff. Any Roman soldier could go, hey, or um, citizen could go, hey, carry this for a mile. Just pick on an Israelite. And Jesus is going, hey, why don't you just go, oh, it's no problem, I'll take it too. So sometimes we evangelize by what we do, and they go, you're just crazy. No, I'm not crazy, I just love Jesus. <laughs> They're like, well, I don't understand why you're so serving. Are you willing to boldly persist like the persistent widow? In uh, Luke 18, I know with kids, as soon as you have kids, it's like, okay, this conversion is not going to happen in a week. <laughs> you sort of reset, okay? As a single, I'd give up on people really easy. But then once you have kids, you realize, this is, I'm going for the long game. Are you willing to go over after lost sheep until you find them and bring them into the fold? Not go after them. Go after them till you find them. Luke 15, 3 to 6. Then Jesus told them this parable. 
Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and say, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. He goes, yeah, I'm just not going to let go. Every single member, the, the person that has been a member of the church, I've kept their number, and I always reach up to every single person that was ever converted. Even when they change the number, I try and hunt them down, as long as they haven't told me not to hunt them down, if you know what I mean. Because people change numbers. I, on Facebook, I'm like, I made a commitment to them when they got baptized that you were in the family. And you made a commitment to go, yeah, and I want to be. And I can tell you, if I ever fall away, you better hunt me down. You better hunt me down and pull me back. Absolutely. You know what? It's a bit forceful. Be forceful with me. Sit me down and go, you flat idiot. You're coming back. We all need that at some point in our life. You know, this Sunday is just a great opportunity to show it. It's an international day. It's fun. We'll have the flags up. We'll have everybody bring your favorite food. I bring pork pies. It's a bit of funny... You get it on the plate, you know, it's a bit weird. I've got some dumplings and some this and that. There's not many vegetables and, you know, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and the clocks go back, so we get an extra night, uh, an extra hour sleep. Okay, so the reason we do it on this week is the visitors go up and go, I feel, oh, I feel a bit fresh. Maybe God's working today. No, you don't realize, okay, we're just clever. Okay, all right, but that's why we do it on this day. Uh, just come and have a lot of fun. Get into a Bible study. You've got to set your mind... Your heart on loving people. It doesn't come naturally. You have to wake up every morning. All right, setting your mind to saving the lost. So when I think about the mind, I think it's like the practicals. You know what I mean? Like the heart is, do I want to do it? The mind is, how am I going to do it? And what I'm grateful for, when you look at Daniel's prayer, in Daniel 10:12, it says, then he continued. The angel spoke to Daniel and says, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gaining understanding... And humble yourself before God. Your words were heard, and I've come in response to them. If you go to God, God, okay, I've got the heart. I want to save people. I haven't got a clue how to do it. Not a clue. Honestly, I got so frustrated as a young Christian, knowing I had the truth, wanting to share it. And, you know, I made some real bad uh, interactions with my family. I studied a Bible with my mom, and I was getting frustrated that she wasn't responding. I really loved her, and I got angry with her. And then she was like, see, you're not a Christian because you're not kind. Now I'm feeling guilty. And, you know, I, I had all this energy, but I didn't know actually how to do it. Let's talk about some practicals. You've got a schedule for success. That is true of anything in life. Yeah. Evangelism. Ongoing and set evangelism. Why do we have set evangelism? Well, most of us need the help. Yeah. Jesus sent people out in twos. Some of you are very gregarious. Like if Beric was here, or like uh, Landa, these, you know, Islanders, they're just like, hey, I'm Landa, how are you? Just, I mean, she just talks to everybody. I expect she actually forgets to share about Jesus sometimes because she just makes friends with everybody. All right, that's not us. We're sitting there going, give me courage, Jesus, give me courage, okay. But we have a set of evangelism. You've got to use that. I know if I come to set of evangelism, at least I know I'm going to get four or five new telephone numbers, meet four or five new friends. And whether it's in the evening or on Saturday. Follow-up time is the biggest sin in the church. You meet people and you don't phone them up. That's just crazy. I, I, this is one thing I've really, really mastered with this. doesn't matter whether it's my friend, whether it's your friend. Um, I'll hang on to anybody. It was great to have Danny and Diana, um, the twin of Boas there. We've been after them for three years or something. You know, but they came to the marriage retreat and then they came to the, to the Sunday service. It's taken us a lot of time. I was going back and forth with my boss, my old boss from 10 years ago today. I may be the only person that will, has a chance of saving him because he lives in the country. If you get a number, you need to treasure it. It's like a response. It's like a child to me. It's like this person was given to me to take care of. Getting the most out of your week. This is my schedule. Um, I try and uh, free it up as much. You can see it in there. I do hourly times. I have 43 hours in a week, okay? So 40 hours I can allocate to anything I want. Bible study, I give my staff this, I hand it out. You want to get with me? You want to bring somebody to study the Bible with me? You want me to come out? I want to do it. But I'm like, I, have, I don't want to wake up going, when am I going to get with somebody? I've got 40 hours I can get with people. So, of course, I can, but do you think like that? Do you try to get the most out of every day, out of every week? I was a young Christian, that's a bit overwhelming. Great, okay, take five hours. 
take six hours, do something. Does that make sense? So you go, okay, I'm going to get with somebody, a new person every day. That's a good goal. Schedule to keep your heart soft. So you've got the practicals. It's much harder to start evangelizing for a while and stop. You know, if you're always evangelizing every day, it's easy to evangelize the next day. If you just come to Thursday and Saturday evangelism, it's actually really hard. You, you sort of, you have to sort of kick yourself up. So really, you've got to do things like daily evangelism. Just have a target. So I'm just going to speak to five people every day. That may be something that just keeps your heart soft. So it makes you invite people like the petrol pump person that you don't normally invite or the person at Coles. You go, before I leave Coles, I'm just going to invite one person. Fasting for a soft heart. You know, if you haven't evangelized for a week or two weeks, be honest and fast. And go, God, it, it, that's a practical. I need to soften my heart and my mind. And we've all been there. Open yourself up to accountability, the bit we all love. Amen. Okay. Um, it's a great to use a personal goal. So when I was, I'm training the interns, I want them to know sort of how much they can do. And I always say, like, you want to try and meet 25 new people a week. You've got a week to do it. We were going through uh, employing uh, Jesse and Liz in two weeks as our full-time shepherd, which is awesome. And um, I would say, you know, as a shepherd, you're going to be counseling a lot of people, but you still need to get out there and evangelize. Maybe like, you know, 10 people a week, meet that. that that'll keep your heart soft and not just be counseling all the time. Okay, because often when you're counseling, you're dealing with the, the, the challenges and sometimes you feel like there's not that many victories. So you've got to balance that with meeting new people. Wednesday, in your groups, when we break up, have some accountability. Okay, you know, you're all friends. You go, what, what's our goals? You're a mum, you're a student, I'm going through exams. What's the target for this week? What are you going to go for? You're, well, I want to invite three people a day, or I want to meet three people, whatever it is. But be honest, be open and help each other be accountable. Don't be fearful to ask somebody to, to implement uh, accountability. We all need it, okay? Um, and if they go, well, I just don't want to do it. Okay, now let's go back to the heart. Why don't you want to do it? Um, be open about it yourself when you haven't met, met them as a leader. Upskill all the time. You know, people are changing all the time. So what attracts somebody to God and church 20 years ago, 10 years ago, isn't the same today, okay? Um, obviously, master first principles. Um, for many years, uh, I would listen to it just before, you know, maybe I don't study the kingdom very often with people. I'd listen to it because you can get it on audio just before I did it. But jump in on those studies. Get out your Bible with people, especially in evangelism. Sometimes eva evangelism to us is not refreshing because we go, hey, do you want to come to church? No. Do you want to come to church? No. You should be having great Bible studies yourself just in your own time. You go, I would like to share this verse that I found with you today in my Bible study. It changes evangelism. Once you show people scriptures, it blows their brain. Our problem is getting people into the Bible. Why not get them into the Bible while you're sharing your faith? Can I, can I just share one scripture with you before you go? They can remember that scripture forever. So get your Bibles out. Uh, be in Bible studies all the time. Let me give you a chance. Everybody in, in this room as a Christian should be in a Bible study every week. Ideally, you should be leading one every week with a friend you have. I don't care if it's two scriptures on a bus. I don't care if it's, you know, deep studies with that. But we should get the word of God out there. The good news is not us. The good news is what's in the Bible. All right? So you've got to get it out there. Just, you know, I know Maddie was met. Uh, Beth just said, hey, come and study the Bible now. The more people you ask, hey, can we go and study the Bible now, like Tim did, the more chance you have of people going yes. Rather than this, let's meet them, get their telephone number, hope they remember me when I eventually call them two weeks later, maybe them get out to church. You, you've got to shortcut all of that. Jesus didn't have a mobile phone. He said, come follow me now. What are you doing now, mate? Well, I'm busy. Well, I'm not that busy. You like fish? Not really. All right, come. You will really be surprised if you imitate Jesus how it works. All right? It's not that hard to evangelize. Use social media. If you're stuck indoors or if you're sick, just get onto social media and evangelize. Just pick up Facebook, get into a group, and evangelize. You know, helping people become Christians keeps you out of sin. That's the truth of it. All right? It also challenges you on your beliefs. I love learning about, you know, other religions and stuff um, because as you evangelize, you know, you meet Zoroastrianism, you meet Hindus, you meet all sorts of different people, and then you go, man, I don't know my Bible well enough. 
I've got to go back and really study this. And this puts the word deeper and deeper in your heart. And if you're focused on that, then you're not focused on looking at dodgy stuff. Who are we looking to save? Well, of course, everyone. However, if we're going to build the church, we can't just solely focus on the unopened people. So I like to describe evangelism like this. There are three types of evangelism. There's hand grenade evangelism. Right? So if you want to catch a fish, you get a hand grenade, you throw it in the sea, boom, and fish come to the top. The problem with that is it hurts the fish. That is street evangelism. So you've got to try and walk alongside people rather than come up to them straight. Like you, you've got to try and be effective as much as you can. Right? Then there's bait fishing. Whereas if you've ever fished, you put bait out um, you know, week in, week out. You go and you fish there. And, and you're throwing in and you catch one, you catch two. All right? that, that's like going to the gym and you, know, you aim at those people or you're in a local community. or You, know, you really aim at the relationships. And there's what I call fly fishing. Whereas fly fishing, you can see the fish. I mean, if you've got a club, you can feel like you go over and then it runs away. So what you have to do with fly fishing, you throw the fly ahead and it floats down the river and you hope that the fish grabs it. That's like evangelizing your mum or Danny and Diana. We've been at them for they're four years. You know what I mean? You're like, you keep throwing it out there, come to a marriage retreat, come to a this, come to an international time, Saul's coming again, my Harry Krishna friend, I'm throwing out the line again, you know, again. Maybe one day he'll come and go, yeah, this is right. Yeah. He said, I was thinking of you, even on my boss, he phoned me up, I got a message today, Joe, so this is my boss from 11 years ago. He said, you're really on my heart the last couple of days, give me a call. I was excited, that's a mess. I'm like, I phoned my, hey, that's what you're looking for, right? Um, the quickest conversion we need to go for, if you really, ideally, we're meeting God believers that aren't really committed. That's what we call your soft han hanging fruit, which is somebody who goes, yeah, I believe in God, but I'm not really going to church right now. Great. They're people that you can convert in two weeks. Kerry was converted in 10 days. She was a God believer, had come from Australia, was met in London, studied the Bible, and boom. And many of you have become Christians that quickly. So there are people who go, hey, yeah, you're a God-believer, you're going to church. No, right, let's study the Bible, let's get you back into this. This is great. You've got then the other long term, which is interested, but they've got obstacles. So Danny and Diana really are interested, but he's like, I don't know how to get out of my business to become a Christian. He absolutely knows the cost. And then you've got your long-term uh, non-believers. We have a lot of Chinese, say, that you have to work with like this. Um, I think Jeremy uh, and Jono, so particularly Jeremy was out, it took us eight months, nine months, then Jono was like, I already believe, and he became a Christian quite quickly. Uh, the, with those, I like to do the study, how to believe in God and Jesus. It's really seeking God, the word, discipleship in one, and going, hey, just come to everything. Yeah. Point three, setting your soul to saving the lost. So what's the difference between heart and soul? Well, heart's like what you want. You know, you drive past a Ferrari, if you're in a car guy, that's what I want. But if you think deeply about it, no, I don't really want it. The soul... That's the spiritual part of the body that you've really got to watch out for. Um, it's the part of you that's under attack from Satan. Ephesians 6.16 says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So in essence, without faith that God is working in your life, you'll get really heart, hurt when you evangelize and give your heart to people. Because we, we're in a a time where we want everything now. We want, we want our mum to become a Christian now, we want our friends to become a Christian now, and then when they don't, we get angry and why God? And you've got to be really careful of this stuff. It's so easy to feel hurt and even angry when people do not respond to the gospel. We must not let their hearts, uh, our hearts, be affected by their rejection. Luke 10, 16, whoever listens to me Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. When people are rejecting the gospel, they are rejecting God, not you. And you must separate the two. Even when people fall away, it breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart. Um, and it's easier said than done to protect your heart. I remember the first time I led a ministry, and this guy, Andrew, and I'd poured my time into him, be like he, he lived on the um, central coast. I mean, I'd drive out, I'd bring him down for midweek and really loved him. And he'd go, I, I just don't want to do it anymore. I just wept and wept and wept. I'm like, but I love you. I just, 
I, rem- I still remember him. It was just outside Birmingham, and I was at, like, not a Bible talk leader. I was like, I don't know if I can do this for the rest of my life. Um, I think so many other people who, ju- who just leave. I love James to death, and I've been chasing James down, but he just won't return my phone call. That's, that's heartbreaking. You've got to really be careful. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. As we do this, we've got to watch our own hearts. We must see that we're in a soldier in a mighty war, a war for souls of all mankind. You know the passage in Ephesians 10, it says, you know, we're in a spiritual battle. Put on your spiritual armor. And sometimes we go, man, I really tried and, you know, I gave my heart this person. They said they were going to get baptized, you know, this weekend and then they just disappear. We even had a one guy, we worked with him for six months at University of New South Wales. Baptized him, Maximus, I think his name was. Six months, he became our friend. Baptized him, never saw him again. Blew my brain. Blew my brain. He came out of the water and I said to one of the sisters, this could be your husband. Literally, I was like, this is exciting. We've worked with the city. He's finally got baptized. We never saw him again. I just, unbelievable. We must not end up like Judas, who wanted the easy life. What was Judas' problem? He walked with Jesus, and he saw how difficult it was, and he went, I want a more comfortable life. That feeling of, I am just done with people. You've got to be careful of that. Hands up the old Christians who've been there. All right, okay, right. You see that? Every one of you. Okay. You've got to be really careful with that. Because it's those moments that you've got to cherish when you see them all come together. Honestly, the marriage retreat, I just sat there, people, you know, I just enjoyed it. There was Chi coming back, and there was Emmanuel coming back, the guys from Taipei, Brian and Millie. I mean, people you might know. It's like, these were the kids when we started the church. And it was just awesome. It was just great to be there. Those moments you need to cherish. And you've got to focus on the ones you save, not the ones you lose. Otherwise, your heart can really, you know, it can go bad places. Judas, when I just can't handle giving my heart, I want to steal a bit of money, I want life to be a little bit more comfortable. It's always a lie. What did Judas go, Judas go and do? He went and killed himself. But you've got to be determined to win souls. There are those that are quick. Dante. Dante studied the Bible and went, I'm taking my whole week off work to study the Bible and become a Christian. And that's what I'm looking for tomorrow when I evangelize. All right? Jono just came to his brother's baptism and went, yeah, yeah, I see it. Okay. You know what I mean? It was like, uh, yeah, I get it. You know, um, That's what you're looking for. The long term. The Obeds, the Gabes. The Danny, and uh, I really appreciate the brothers in the north just not giving up on Gabe. A couple of years, you know, Obed's like, yeah, I'm not the longest convert now, okay. Uh, But it's like, but what great people. What great people. Step back and see the fruit of your labor. The international church, it'd be great at the conference this year. Um, You'll start to see, you'll see all the Fijians that come in. You'll see all the people from Brisbane. You'll see all the people from, from Melbourne. Um, there's more islanders now, and we're all starting thinking about maybe sending up Kiribati and places like this. And you're like, man, this is this is just wild. I think the new staff it was great. Just uh, you know, I, <laughs> I had my staff and I said, okay, the over 13s can come here and the under 13s can come here. It's like I said, old guys, and then all those was running around with Nerf guns and all that sort of stuff. And but I was like, it's great to see so many young people come through and want to go on staff. The new disciples. Isn't it just great to see Jeremy and the Stacy brothers? It's not like a Western. Here comes the Stacy brothers. <laughs> Who will be next? Who are you bringing this week? Isn't it great that Chantal went up to Brisbane, baptized her best friend Kiri? She came down here a year ago, two years ago. That's why we send out mission teams, guys. That's why. What family members can you bring on Sunday? Well, I've invited them before. Well, if they're going to become Christians, they've got to come to church one Sunday, haven't they? Maybe Tim's dad, this is the Sunday he comes and goes, okay, I have my cards in, Joe. Maybe it's your mom. I phoned, you know, Maggie's brother. I'm like, I met with him once. I got his number. I'm on the phone to him. I'll get him. You leave him with me. But like, I'm praying like, maybe his job doesn't work out in Perth. I think maybe here and abroad. Do you follow up for abroad? Maddie's uh, family got baptized after she came here. 
Don't give up on your family. I think Pete was like, didn't you meet your cousin and you heard she was baptized, met by somebody in San Francisco, she became a Christian. He's like, man, my cousin became a Christian and somebody just met her randomly. Like, whoa, it was great. Open up your heart, open up your mind. Who do you know in Hong Kong? Who do you know in Melbourne? You know, setting your heart, mind and soul to saving the lost. What I want you to do is I want you to do this in your quiet time tomorrow. You go, man, I've got to get my heart around this. First thing I do is I just pray through all the people on my phone. And when I pray through them, then I want to text them. You've got to set your heart to saving lost. You've got to do that again and again and again and again. You've got to set your mind to it. You've got to look at your practicals on the, hey, am I not turning up to set vans? Am I not opening myself up for how I'm not doing? And set your soul to saving lost. If you are hurt and you've put your heart back from loving people, then tell somebody. Maybe tell one of the shepherds, hey, can I get some time with you tomorrow? I'm just... I hear it, I want to do it, but I'm just really hurt by this guy that fell away, you know, three years ago, and I've never got over it. Deal with your heart. The challenge, everybody have a visitor this Sunday. Do whatever it takes. Saturday, the great thing about, I love about Saturday evangelism, it's the best chance to meet somebody and go, do you want to come to church tomorrow? I know when we met in Pitt Street, I'd evangelize that 100 yards and go, we meet there, we meet there. And I had so many visitors just by... You know, why don't you go and door knock around Abraham Mott Hall on Saturday afternoon? Remember when I challenged people to do that for the Women's Day? They door knocked around Women's Day, and guess what they had on Women's Day? Visitors. Go, well, I don't know anybody. Go and door knock all those doors around Abraham Mott Hall on Saturday afternoon. Get yourself a visitor. Go, I'll pick you up at 5 to 10 on Sunday. Knock, knock, knock. In you come. Okay. Um, so I'm not dressed yet. All right, we'll back. come back in 10 minutes. No problem. All right. But set your soul to save and lost. Everybody have somebody in Sunday, and everybody have a personal Bible study in the next seven days. You know what? It will set your world on fire. There's nothing like having that guy next to you at church, and you're like, preach the word, Joe, preach the word, get him, get him, get him. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it's like? like? That's what you want. And have a great international day this Sunday. Amen. <laughs> to hear more from Dr. Joe Willis, check out his two books on Amazon, the Art of Spiritual Warfare, Practicals for Becoming a Prayer Warrior, and Money is the Answer for Everything. Click the links in the description below. Also, for more life-changing lessons, subscribe to his YouTube channel, Dr. Joe Willis.